Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. <laughs> so what was uh, childhood like for you in the 80s then? Uh, uh, is it like the movies or...? Um, yeah, the movies depicted yeah a, a good amount of things that you that I can kind of ascribe to. Absolutely, the eighties was full of um, drugs. the The eighties seemed to have been um, the inner city was taken advantage of at that point. Um, the eighties were filled with so many different things, and you know, the poverty <laughs> we had mm -hmm. drug addiction. Um, um, I don't know anybody, if I'm thinking about it, during that era that didn't have anybody in their families affected by what that era brought. The 80s um, was certainly a time drug ridden. I mean, I don't we, we lived in a city that was filled full with it and um, any and everybody was affected by it. I don't care if it was through you actually being on the street. Um, doing what you do um or somebody in your family using and those were very very hard times because um you know jail was overpopulated uh yeah. the streets was riddled riddled with many different things and it it's wonderful um to at this point use that and just pay attention to it i did research some time ago was just trying to figure out how did that happen I'm not going to go into any detail about it, but it it was it was designed that way. Um, in no uncertain terms, were we able, were you know during that era where we were supposed to escape that, and that's very sad. Um, I'm blessed that I've never uh, had a problem with drugs. Um, I've never been incarcerated for any drug related issues. That's not to say that I didn't have my time fooling around with uh, things that were not safe, but I'm I'm blessed to not have been, um, you know, put in that. So I'm I'm no better than anybody else. So let me just make that clear. It's just um, I just kind of bypassed that by the grace of God. And for the folks that did, I'm sure it was a learning lesson for them. I see so many people that were overtaken by the lifestyle. And they're they're rebuilding and trying to build life for themselves, which is which is awesome compared to what we had to do, endure. So everybody's got stained by it, and yeah. it it you know it kind of made you you know understand what life was really all about, and just take care of your families and just be better. Um, uh, I don't take anything for granted from that era, but it was certainly something that wasn't fun at the time. Um, I remember. Um, <laughs> eating, eating, eating welf welfare cheese. Um, it was um, that the whole inner city. If you do your research, I'm not going to get into too much into details. Just r do your research and just understand that those times, those eras, was by design. And if you made it out of there, man, congratulations to you. And you know, mm -hmm. God bless to the ones that didn't, and that, and some of them are still affected by it. But for the most part. That was a heavy, heavy error to overcome. I enjoyed it, though, because it makes us who we are. So those difficult times kind of gives us our grit and grime to get through life. And I appreciated them and enjoyed them to some degree. And, um, you know, that's the music really reflects that era, that that nostalgia of what that really represented. And I'll carry it forever. It's just a part of me and um, just kind of you know, still controlled my environment and just kind of be visual and paying attention to what's around me. And I still loved it, although it was crazy. I still mm -hmm. loved it and it kind of helped me through life. So. Yeah. And I was going to ask you that. I was actually going to ask you, did you bring any of that childhood stuff, that mentality from the streets and the way you grew mm -hmm. up with your family and your childhood and the house? Did you bring that and put it into your adulthood, your, your music even? Does that, does it motivate you? Does it, you know yeah to to some degree i think it does and i think the negative at some point turns into a positive and that negative yeah. is 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 going to is going to fuel you in any regard to be better and it 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 does mature you very fast it gives you um um motivation that you don't want to want to be there 
you don't you don't want to be in that era. And I think sometimes I'll say this: um, the way I grew up is not the way I raised my children, right? So there's certain things that I, you know, my mother and, and my father wouldn't probably do. You know what I mean? Um, that I would to my kids, but my and certain things that my mother and father would do to me, it's just just a different era. Um, my dad um, became subject to um, um, to the street and ultimately became subject to them. And he carried that to, um, it's just we picked up a whole lot of different things during that era. And um, it definitely motivated me as, an, as a parent to just be better. Um, not that they weren't better or weren't good. It's just that era has just kind of brought something else out of you. Um, and it kind of gave its children some some strength to not want to deal with that stuff as we raise our children so yeah yeah i agree because um i didn't have a bad childhood at all i i I know i enjoyed my primary school and my high school but Mm. uh you know i've obviously moved to melbourne australia and i couldn't Mm. imagine my children going to my high school now like Mm -mm. with with the life they lead um and Mm. and of course there's there's issues here and there's problems here as Mm. as like anywhere else Mm -hmm. of course i'm not saying this is paradise you know, I've ventured some down my darkest days here in Australia, to be fair, but I couldn't imagine my son going, or you know, my daughter going to my high school and just, you know, just even the way the, the, the people walk down the corridors, I couldn't imagine my son in those situations, you know. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, no, I struggle with that. But you're absolutely right. Um, with, with, um, with you growing up in New Jersey, and then um, what would have your household looked like? Um, my household would look like, um, we used to live on a street called Epps Avenue in Inglewood, New Jersey. Um, it was a house mainly filled with love. You know, my mother was very loving or still is very loving. Um, she provided for her children. There was four of us in the household. Um, my dad was in and out, you know, the streets were, you know, a part of him at that moment. Um, Mm -hmm. so he was in and out and. Um, she was there most of the time just trying to make do what she had, what we had. And, you know, we all walked down the street, you know, with grease on our face. You know, we were, we, we we were going to be clean. (laughs) That was one thing we were going to be, we were going to be clean and we were going to be dressed to a T. Nobody in those days, uh, uh, could really afford too much of anything, but we did eat every day. We did dress the best we could, and it was it was life for us. So um, life would look like me um, upstairs in my own room. I had three sisters that were in another room, and my mom and my dad, to some degree, was downstairs, and we lived. You know what I mean? I was a um, a destructive kid. I enjoyed um, tearing apart cars like you know you get the remote control cars i tear them down and and build something else with them you know i would never never keep anything whole everything i would tear it down or take the screws out of it i would take the motors out of them and create fans and all type of stuff so i was always technically wanting to get in to see what things did in the inside so i i was intrigued by it so if i was doing anything more or less I was upstairs tearing something up if I got it and just recreating what I thought was something else. Just the child. That's why um, you're so good at like taking, fixing keyboards and all that stuff. The, I absolutely, as growing up, you know, what did you want to be when you grow up? I, I did not want to be a doctor. I wanted to be a keyboard technician. I wanted oh, to right. take keyboards apart. I wanted to do, I wanted to do that. Who do I know? That 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 does that at this point. I don't know anybody who does that. Nobody. I am a guy that you know. I get calls now. I need my keyboard fixed. Like, what's wrong with it? So they'll bring it over, and you know, I'll fix it and give it back. And they're looking at me like, "How the hell did you do that?" And I'm like, "I couldn't even tell you if if I could. (laughs) I just take it apart and fix it. I'll know exactly what's wrong with it." Take it apart, give it to them, and it'll work like so. All of my key keyboards, I don't even ever get those. I don't even take those keyboards to um to the repair shop. I repair myself everything. That's good. That's yeah. awesome. So that's Wait. what my house looked like. <laughs> Would the um where does uh, your gift of music come from then? Yeah, my dad was a musician. 
um um the DNA for music I'm I'm sure it was a gift from God and a part of him he enjoyed music to a, to a large degree he was a church musician um of course he dived into R&B a little bit but not as much as he did gospel gospel was his thing um um, another part of my house would look like if he was home, he would be playing a piano that's in the front room and I would be on the step listening to him and he would be um, he would have me uh, playing drums on a paper bag just to keep time. And um, he said, you got to beat your beat. He said, don't pay attention to what I'm doing to that degree. He said, just beat your beat. He said, your rhythm. So he was heavily rhythm minded. He wanted the rhythm to be on point because that would give him his vibe. So that is kind of where I would get that. The rhythm has got to be right. Once the rhythm is good, a, a keyboardist and a bass guitar player can just lay inside of it and just it'll create such a great vibe. So that's where that comes from. So he is the one that kind of uh, pushed me. Not necessarily push me. Let me change that. My dad wasn't a really, really good pusher. He wasn't going to push you to do anything. So you were going to have to pay attention to what he was doing because he wasn't going to show you anything particularly. He might even give you a couple of chords, but you had to be the one, you know, to to do what you did. You know, if you wanted to be a part of it, yeah, you'd be a part of it. If you don't, no problem. I'm not going to push you. So I enjoyed music so much. I just, as soon as I heard... Uh, at that time, it was Rhodes 73, I believe it was. And as soon as you hear that thing snap on, I'm I'm downstairs with my paper bag and my drumsticks sticks listening. Love it. So, yeah, that's so where my your, music comes from. Well, your love of music then is, is clearly, like, it's really authentic. It's not, you know, like, I'm pushing mm. basketball. Well, I felt like I probably pushed basketball down my son's throat, but mm -hmm. now... I, I, I want him to go outside mm -hmm. on the lights on a timer for quarter to 11. Hold on, yeah. I need to turn that back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every night. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, I feel like I probably pushed him from a such an early, early age, but not an aggressive way, just yeah. a, a yeah. real passionate love way. But yeah. he, didn't, he didn't come to watch me play basketball and then he wanted it. I was like, here's a basketball, have a dribble. <laughs> You know nah. I mean? <laughs> no, it's truly authentic. I wanted to do it. That's you know, awesome. I would be on that church pew in the front, you know, strumming my guitar. And I'm from the era of music where you just couldn't play one one instrument. You had to play a, a plethora of them. I was playing guitar. I was playing drums. I was blowing saxophone. I was playing keyboard. I was at a young age. I'm introduced to those things. So right now to this day, Every part of my production is something that I've played. I've played everything. So um, music is important to me. Now, I'm from that era that you had to play. You had to. You couldn't, uh, you know, they didn't have computers at the time. Um, you know, this, what we have going on, you know, when you in Australia and I'm here in the South, in America, it's just like, this is unheard of. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So you had to, you know, know how to play your instrument and, um, the vibe of music now um, from the older artist is, is reflective and of those times where you had to play your instrument. And sure enough, um, I love it all. That's just what a part, it's just a part of me. So he is a, you know, God bless him, you know, salute to my pops. You know, he um, is absolutely the, the, the star of everything that I kind of do. He, he's got, I got, I got his DNA. Um, can't help it. And that, that's just what it is. <laughs> Yeah. So with with the links to um, what you was you how your dad uh, you know like you mentioned about your dad um, mm. on the streets uh, living yeah. in New Jersey, mm. do you think music kind of was like um, a sidetrack to that? You didn't get sucked into that life. Mm -hmm. um, do Do you think it, it's, it's that cliche saying it, it? It kept me off the streets. It's absolutely did. Of course, we were subject to it just because it was just part of the culture at that point. At mm. that point, but music absolutely saved me. No questions asked. Um, I was really good in football. I started as a football player on my high school team as a freshman, and mm. um, I was really good. And you know, halfway through the season, I disappeared. Everybody's like, well, "Where the hell is Kenny at?" You know, Kenny is with the band. <laughs> You know, they see me on the band doing formation with my high school band with the bass drum. And um, music was, I, 
I just loved it. I didn't care too much about sports to that degree. Even now, if the football game is on, I'm like, all right, you know, I'm in the studio trying to create something. Um, so, you know, music is my relaxation. M- music is my is my essence. Music is just something that I do because I enjoy doing it. I love it more than watching football. So mm. that helped me um, when everybody was at the club. Everybody was on the street sometimes. I would be in the studio or somewhere creating some music or writing or doing something. Of course, you know, like I said before, you don't do it all the time. But yeah. 90% of the time I was going to be doing music somewhere. So it did help me stay the heck out of the street um, terribly because there, there definitely was a pull to get me in the street. But I'm grateful that my pull towards music was, was greater. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And so with your family life then and living with your mom and your dad, mm-hmm. um, how did that going going from your primary school into high school, how did mm-hmm. life change for you then going into the teenage years? Uh the teenage years, uh, well, okay, so as as life progressed, I believe, um, as I was coming up, you know, transitions happened. I think my dad and my mom, you know, start to have difficulty. Um, mm-hmm. music was still a part of it. Um, as we moved going up to the high school, my high school years, that's when it kind of got really, really crazy. My mom and dad, I don't believe were together at that point and, um, music was still there. It was just something that kind of held me down gave me my peace. Um, high school though, um, I honed in on music a, a lot more and I kind of knew that it was something that I really wanted to do, period. Didn't want to do anything else. Didn't want to play basketball. I wasn't good, good at basketball. I tried wrestling. I didn't like the physical contact of wrestling. You know, I didn't understand the concept of it. Um, Football was something I enjoyed to do. I loved, you know, running the gridiron. I I loved conditioning. I loved lifting weights. I loved doing all of that. But music was it. Um, As I moved through high school, um, I became a part of uh, the high school band. Um, Tony Antonio Underwood was my teacher. Uh, Joseph Daly was my teacher. Uh, uh, Hubert Ashley was my teacher, all a part of either the steel drum band or, or the uh, high school band. Um, all of those were just times in my life where I was, I was a church kid, right? So I was a church kid, um, really playing music and putting a spin on it. I was always creative with my mind. Um, my sister actually was a part of because she got the high school band first because she was a part of the, uh, I think, you know, they was trolling flags or something. I can't remember what you call it. Mm-hmm. And um, she brought me, and I was a, I was in middle school at that point, at that time. And at that time, I think I was playing a saxophone for Mr. Goldberg. Man, this is crazy because I'm thinking about all these names here. Mr. Goldberg, <laughs> I was playing saxophone in the middle school, and um, my sister um, told me to come to the high school one day. And I came to the high school one day. I think I met... Uh, Joseph Daly and my sister said oh he can play he can play so I got on the keyboard and started playing I was at that point I was playing a lot of funk stuff a lot of, I was playing a lot of funk my left hand on the bass line was going crazy and he was looking at it like how the hell old is this kid you know <laughs> just doing the funk on the, and he was looking at me like whoa whoa what a minute so I loved it so much I found myself going back to the high school on a regular basis um, once I understood music and how to create and how to learn, know people and learn people, I would be there. And um, when I got to the high school, he already knew who I was, and I just became a part of the band. And you know, the rest is history. You know, it's just like I stayed there. I played uh, keyboard for the high school band. And as I matriculated through high school, I played drums for the steel drum band. Steel drum band was ran by either Hubert Ashley. Um, who was a phenomenal pianist, um, and then Antonio Underwood, who is was the person that really pushed the envelope of my musicianship. Um, he is a very known in uh, the film scoring world. Um, he's done some stuff for BB Winans. He's done some stuff for um, McCoy Turner. Um, he's a tubist. He's a tuba player. Phenomenal guy loves it and he loves music he graduated from um yale university very very influential guy into really pushing the envelope on my musicianship and i played drums for him for the steel drum band we were uh 
uh, we played for the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, probably uh-huh. one of the biggest hotel hotels in the world. I think they filled Home Alone there, I believe. Uh, that oh, is big it the Plaza. Hotel, the Plaza. That's the yeah. big Waldorf uh, Astoria. I didn't uh, know we that. played. I've we been played, to the Plaza. We played there for the World Games during that time. Wow. And um, we were a steel drum band that was asked to come there to play. Played. Uh, and I loved it so much. I didn't necessarily need a full drum set at that time. I played the timbales. I played the timbales, a cowbell, and a cymbal. <laughs> so uh, I hit that way. We loved it because it was easy to transport and we can get in and get out. Still provided the, the rhythm that it needed. And mm. the whole, the whole, the high school steel drum band was a world renowned steel drum band. You know, I wish I had documentation. I asked Mr. Underwood, who was still actually doing his thing on this tuba thing. Um, he didn't have any documentation back in those days. I think it was like 93. He didn't have anything to keep it. He just got a document which, you know, said that we were a part of it. Uh, you know, it was, it was just a great time for me. I enjoyed that. Singing didn't come uh, public until a young man by the name of Jeremy Hanna. Jeremy Hanna is probably one of the greatest vocals. He, I'm not going on. I'm not going to run down his list of stuff that he's written for. Phenomenal writer. I was uh, singing coming from a class. I believe I was going home. He was coming up the stairs, coming towards me, and I didn't realize he was coming. And I have my headphones on, and I'm singing, 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 singing. Nobody ever knew that I sung. He was the singer, not me. I was too shy. So he's coming up the stairway and he's saying, um, who is that singing? I was like, I don't know. And I know him. You know, I grew up with him. You know, he went to the same churches I did. Our families knew each other. We grew up together. So he was like, who was singing? I was like, yo, I don't know. He was like, nah, that was you. There's nobody around here. He's like, that was you? I was like, nah, that wasn't me. I would never admit to it. And I was like, golly, it was me. <laughs> So he was actually the first one that really, other than my my family, when you were singing in the shower, you know, you're singing in the shower in the tub. Your mother's like, man, shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy was the one that caught me singing, coming up the stairway. I always remember that. I don't even know if you know that story, but. I I do. And you've answered like the next three questions. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Um, Yeah. So Jeremy, when he hears this, um, this interview, he's going to be like, yo, that's very true. And um, he was the first one. Will he remember? Yeah, I think he will when he know when he understood when he when he remembers me coming up and he was like, "Yeah, that was you." I was like, "Nah, that wasn't me." He was like, "There's nobody around here, man. What you talking about?" And um, he was really the first one to kind of hear me really sing. I don't know where it went after that, um, because I think I was still um a little shy to sing. But when I started, you know, I, I go to church and you couldn't in those days go to church and not do anything. Our pastor wanted us to sing or wanted us to do something, the young folks to do something. She would you know, say, get up and sing. And you would have to get up and sing. It wasn't a choice. And wow. I, I would get up and sing. And everybody was like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, I didn't know you could do that. It, you know, then it just kind of kept going and going and going. And, you know, once you start a singer singing, he's not going to stop. In many cases, he's going to continue to go. So that's how it yeah. started. It didn't stop. I kept singing. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then the confidence obviously grew because you said you were, you know, you're shy and quiet. Yeah, I, I, I believe I started to sing um, um, pretty regularly at that time. I got an opportunity to sing for Ray Barreto Jr. He was doing a project for a record he was putting out. Aaron Miller was um, a, another influential guy that, and um, Aaron Miller and John Marshall. John Marshall was a, a, a very, very good friend of mine still to this day. Um, we were a part of the uh, the high school band. Um, Aaron Miller um, was a drummer for Latoya Jackson oh, back yeah. when she was on tour. Very phenomenal guy. He uh, 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 got an opportunity with Ray Barreto Jr. Um, to do some projects for him, and I started singing for him. And um, that's when it kind of kind of grew and grew. And grew so after at that time I was doing backgrounds I was doing lead vocals, and 
just couldn't scratch the it just couldn't scratch the itch. The itch was still I couldn't get rid of it. I just had to continue to do it. And um it just became something I'd done all the time at that point. How old were you at this point? Whew. I wasn't even shoot, maybe sixteen. Oh wow. Yeah, maybe sixteen. It's two thousand and yeah, sixteen, seventeen. No, yeah, I was about sixteen, seventeen. Yep, yep, I was about sixteen. Six, sixteen. I was like yeah. sixteen. Yep. So that you, your confidence started to really shine at that point. Was it? Mm. Was that the turning point? That was when it was just like, yeah, this is what I want to do exclusively. So of course, at those points, you know, you, you know, you. I didn't really go after a deal. I got a deal one time actually with Ray Barreto. I was going to get signed with him. Uh, as a um, as a studio singer, just kind of doing demos, you know, for artists that are coming up, just doing a bunch of demos. And um, my mother wouldn't let me sign the deal. Oh, why not? I I don't know. She's I don't know. She just too I, young. I, would, I don't know if it was, I think it was just too that too much of that. I, th- I think she's heard too many stories about people in the industry that would take yeah. advantage, and um, I'm sure she was trying to protect me. But for me, I was like, this is what I want to do. I don't care anything about it, about anything else. Um, I'll be fine. <laughs> hey, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. You know, he is, you know, he reassured her. And I remember him sitting down with her and she wouldn't let me sign it. She would not let me sign the deal. Was that so, a good deal? I mean, at 16 years old, you're not really thinking about how good or bad it is. You're just trying to yeah. get out there. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I didn't sign the deal. And, yeah. um, that was the kind of the, you know, I got a couple of others, but you know, that was the, that was the first one that was like, yeah, nah, I can't do that. I was upset. I was upset because it was something I wanted to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. I, I guess she was trying to protect me and I get that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I can't hold it against her, you know, kind of move on at some point you grow past it. And I did, and I just kept grinding and grinding and grinding. Um, I started doing music and when I started writing, it was, um, I got an opportunity through Mr. Underwood to see um, um, a, intro, uh, a very powerful person in the industry at that point. There was an artist, I don't even like to say his name, but Mario. Mario was his name. He was um, starting out on his career. And at that time, I remember Mario, he was um, um, so young, he had to get uh, like tutoring. You know, that's how he was taking his course classes because at that point, he was starting to kind of get in the industry really big and writing so well, and singing songs. I cre- I created some music at the time to, and I submitted them to his manager at the time. And although he liked the music, um, he said it needed more direction. And the direction was the actual words, what the artist would sing. Um, and I didn't get that opportunity because I needed to have vocals and words on the song so i could sing and do all of that stuff but i didn't understand that concept of writing and i didn't understand it then so mm-hmm. immediately i went into writing <laughs> i got into writing whether it was oh, good so that or was not. the journey then that was a journey yep when he told me that um he loved the music but he did not know what direction i was going to go in as far as the context of the songs um although the music was good he kind of needed a complete project. And at that point, I didn't know, you know, you're kind of journeying along. You're trying to trying to figure out what you're going to do. It didn't work, but um, it was just a great moment so I could kind of get there and understand what that meant or what that means. And once I understood what it meant, I said, okay, I got to be on this journey um, to um, start writing. And that's when writing started. Hmm. That's when writing yeah. started. So going back to your um, the just briefly the separation between your mum and your father, mm-hmm. um, when they separated, uh, mm-hmm. did your dad disappear from your life or was he still very much around? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.